Chapter six. Bye, Lugaselwa. Don't forget to write if you ever hit the ground. I'd heard worse plans, but while the idea of pushing Lou off a building had a certain appeal, I was skeptical that she really meant it, especially since she wouldn't explain further or offer us details. Tomorrow, she insisted, once we're on our way. The next morning, Sally made us breakfast. Estelle giggled at us hysterically. Paul apologized for not having a car to lend us since the family Prius, which we usually crashed, was on its way to California with Percy Grover and Annabeth. The best, the best Paul could offer us was a subway pass, but I wasn't ready to ride any more trains. Sally gave us all hugs and wished us well. Then she said she had to get back to baking cookies, which she did to relieve stress while she was working on the revisions for her second novel. This raised many questions for me. Second novel? We hadn't discussed her writing at all the night before. Cookies? Could we wait until they were done? But I suspected that good food was a never-ending temptation here at the Jackson Blowfist home. There would always be a next sweet or savory snack that was more appealing than facing the harsh world. Also, I respected the fact that Sally needed to work. As the god of poetry, I understood revisions. Facing monsters and imperial mercenaries was much easier. At least the rain had stopped, leaving us a steamy June morning. Lou, Meg, and I headed toward the East River on foot, ducking from alley to alley until Lou found a location that seemed to satisfy her. Just off First Avenue, a 10-story apartment building was in the process of a gut renovation. Its brick facade was a hollow shell, its windows empty frames. We sneaked through the alley behind the lot, climbed over a chain link construction fence, and found the back entrance blocked only by a sheet of plywood. Lou broke through it with one sturdy kick. After you, she said. I eyed the dark doorway. We really have to go through with this? I'm the one who has to fall off the roof, she muttered. Stop complaining. The building's interior was reinforced with metal scaffolding, rung ladders leading from one level to the next. Oh, good. After climbing Sutro Tower, I just loved the idea of more ladders. Rays of sunlight sliced through the structure's hollow interior, swirling up dust clouds and miniature rainbows. Above us, the roof was still intact. From the topmost tier of scaffolding, a final ladder led up to a landing with a metal door. Lou began to climb. She changed back into her Amtrak disguise, so she wouldn't have to explain the electronics Megamart shirt to Nero. I followed in my Percy Jackson hand-me-downs. My funny Valentine Meg brought up the rear. Just like old times at Sutro Tower, except with 100% less Reina Avila Ramiro Sariano and 100% more tattooed gall. On each level, Meg stopped to sneeze and wipe her nose. Lou did her best to stay away from the windows, as if worried that Nero might burst through one and yell, Boare! I'm pretty sure that was Latin for boo. It's been a while since I attended one of Cicero's famous haunted house parties. That man did love to put a toga over his head and scare his guests. Finally, we reached the metal door, which had been spray-painted with a red-stenciled warning. Roof access restricted. I was sweaty and out of breath. Lou seemed unperturbed by the climb. Meg kicked absently at the nearest brick as if wondering whether she could collapse the building. Here's the plan, Lou said. I know for a fact Nero has cameras in the office building across the street. It's one of his properties. When we burst out this door, his surveillance team should get some good footage of us on the roof. Remind us why that's a good thing, I asked. Lou muttered something out of her breath. Perhaps a prayer for her, for her Celtic gods to smack me upside the head. Because we're going to let Nero see what we want him to see. We're going to put on a show. Meg nodded. Like on the train. Exactly, Lou said. You two run out first. I'll follow a few steps behind you like I finally cornered you and I'm ready to kill you. In a strictly play-acting way, I hoped. It has to look real, Lou said. We can do it. Meg turned to me with a look of pride. You saw us on the train, Lester. And that was with no planning. When I lived at the tower, Lou would help me fake these incredible battles, so Father, Nero, I mean, would think I killed my opponents. I stared at her. Kill. Your opponents? Like servants or prisoners or just people he didn't like? Lou and I would work it out beforehand. I'd pretend to kill them, fake blood and everything. Then after, Lou would drag them out of the arena and let them go. The deaths look so real, and Nero never caught on. I couldn't decide what I found most horrifying, Meg's uncomfortable slip into calling Nero father, or the fact that Nero had expected his young stepdaughter to execute prisoners for his amusement, or the fact that Lou had conspired to make the show non-lethal to spare Meg's feelings rather than, oh, 
I don't know, refusing to do Nero's dirty work in the first place and getting Meg out of that house of horrors? And are you any better? taunted a small voice in my brain. How many times have you stood up to Zeus? Okay, small voice. Fair point. Tyrants are not easy to oppose or walk away from, especially when you depend on them for everything. I swallowed the bitter taste in my mouth. What's my role? Meg and I will do most of the fighting. Lou hefted her crossbow. Apollo, you stumble around and cower in fear. I can do that. Then, when it looks like I'm about to kill Meg, you scream and charge me. You've had bursts of godly strength from time to time, I've heard. I can't summon one on command. You don't have to. Pretend. Push me as hard as you can, right off the roof. I'll let you do it. I looked over the scaffold railing. We're ten stories up. I know this because we're ten stories up. Yes, Lou agreed. Should be about right. I don't die easily, little Lester. I'll break some bones, no doubt, but with luck I'll survive. With luck? Meg suddenly didn't sound so confident. Lou summoned a scimitar into her free hand. We have to risk it, Sobling. Nero has to believe I did my very best to catch you. If he suspects something... Well, we can't have that. She faced me. Ready? No, I said. You still haven't explained how Nero intends to burn down the city, or what we're supposed to do once we get captured. Lou's fiery look was quite convincing. I actually believed she wanted to kill me. He's Greek fire. More than Caligula did. More than anyone else has ever dared to stockpile. He has some delivery system in place. I don't know the details, but as soon as he suspects something is wrong, one push of a button and it's all over. That's why we have to go through this elaborate charade. We have to get you inside without him realizing it's a trick. I was trembling again. I stared down at the concrete floor and imagined it was disintegrating, dropping into a sea of green flame. So what happens when we're captured? The holding cells, Lou said. They're very close to the vault where Nero keeps his fashes. My spirits rose at least a millimeter. This wasn't good news exactly, but at least Lou's plan now seemed a little less insane. The Emperor's fashes, the golden axe that symbolized his power, would be connected to Nero's life force. In San Francisco, we destroyed the fashes of Komodo and Caligula and weakened the Emperor's just enough to kill them. If we could do the same to Nero... So you break us out of our cells, I guessed, and lead us to this vault. That's the idea. Lou's expression turned grim. Of course, the fascist is guarded by, well, something terrible. What? Meg asked. Lou's hesitation scared me worse than any monster she might have named. Let's deal with that later. One impossible thing at a time. Yet again, I found myself agreeing with the gall. This worried me. Okay, then, she said. Lester, after you push me off the roof, you and Meg get to Camp Half-Blood as fast as you can. Find a demigod team to infiltrate the tunnels. Nearest people won't be far behind you. But we don't have a car. Ugh, almost forgot. Lou glanced down at her belt as if she wanted to grab something, then realized her hands were full of weapons. Sapling, reach into my pouch. Meg opened the small leather bag. She gasped at whatever she saw inside, then pulled it out, tightly clutched in her hand, not letting me see. Really? She bounced up and down with excitement. I get to go? I get to? Lou chuckled. Why not? Special occasion. Yay! Meg slipped whatever it was into one of her gardening pouches. I felt like I missed something important. Um, what? Enough chat, Lou said. Ready? Run. I was not ready, but I had gotten used to being told to run. My body reacted for me, and Meg and I burst through the door. We scrambled over the silver tar surface, dodging air vents and stumbling on loose bricks. I got into my role with depressing ease. Running for my life? Terrified and helpless? Over the last six months, I'd rehearsed that plenty. Lou bellowed and charged after us. Twin crossbow bolts whistled past my ear. She was really selling the whole murderous gall thing. My heart leapt into my throat, as if I were actually in mor mortal danger. Too quickly, I reached the edge of the roof. Nothing but a waist-high lip of brick separated me from a hundred-foot drop into the alley below. I turned and screamed as Lou's blade flashed toward my face. I arched backward, not fast enough. Her blade sliced a thin line across my forehead. Meg materialized, screaming with rage. She blocked the gall's next strike and forced her to turn. Lou dropped the crossbow and summoned her second blade, 
The two Jimakari went at it in full bore dramatic interpretation of Kung Fu Cuisinarts. I stumbled, too stunned to feel pain. I wondered why warm rain was trickling into my eyes. Then I wiped it away, looked at my fingers, and realized, nope, that's not rain. Rain wasn't usually bright red. Meg's sword flashed, driving the big gall back. Lou kicked her in the gut and sent her reeling. My thoughts were sluggish, pushing through a syrupy haze of shock, but I seemed to remember I had a role in this drama. What was I supposed to do after the running and the cowering? <laughs> yes, I was supposed to throw Lou off the roof. A giggle bubbled up in my lungs. I couldn't see with the blood in my eyes. My hands and feet felt like water balloons, wobbly and warm and about to burst. But sure, no problem. I would just throw a huge dual sword-wielding warrior off the roof. I staggered forward. Lou thrust with her left blade, stabbing Meg in the thigh. Meg yelped and stumbled, crossing her swords just in time to catch Lou's next strike, which would have cleaved her head in two. Wait a second. This fight couldn't be an act. Pure rage lit the girl's eyes. Lou had deceived us, and Meg was in real danger. Fury swelled inside me. A flood of heat burned away the haze and filled me with godly power. I bellowed like one of Poseidon's sacred bulls at the altar. And let me tell you, those bulls did not go gently into the slaughter. I barreled toward Lugaselwa, who turned wide-eyed but had no time to defend herself. I tackled her around the waist, lifted her over my head as easily as if she were a medicine ball, and tossed her off the side of the building. I overdid it. Rather than dropping back, then dropping into the alley, she sailed over the rooftops of the next block and disappeared. A half a second later, a distant metallic clunk echoed from the canyon of First Avenue, followed by the angry weep, weep, weep of a car alarm. My strength evaporated. I wobbled and fell to my knees. Blood trickled down my face. Meg stumbled over to me. Her new white leggings were soaked through from the wound on her thigh. Your head, she murmured. I know. Your leg. She fumbled through her gardening pouches until she found two rolls of gauze. We did our best to mummify each other and stop the bleeding. Meg's fingers trembled. Tears welled in her eyes. I'm sorry, I told her. I didn't mean to throw Lou so far. I just... I thought she was really trying to kill you. Meg peered in the direction of First Avenue. It's fine. She's tough. She's... She's probably fine. But no time to talk. Come on. She grabbed my waist and pulled me up. We somehow made it back inside, then managed to navigate the scaffolds and ladders to get out of the hollow apartment building. As we limped the nearest intersection, my heartbeat flumped irregularly, like a trout on the floorboards of a boat. Ugh, I had Poseidon on the brain now. I imagined a caravan of shiny black SUVs full of Germ Germani roaring toward us and circling our location to take us into custody. If Nero had indeed seen what happened on that rooftop, it was only a matter of time. We'd given him quite a show. He would want our autographs, followed by our heads on a silver plate. At the quarter of 81st and 1st, I scanned the traffic. No sign of Germani yet. No monsters, no police, or civilians screaming that they'd just witnessed a Gaulish warrior fall from the sky. What now? I asked, really hoping Meg had an answer. From her pouches, Meg fished out an item that Lou had given her. A shiny golden Roman coin. Despite everything we'd just been through, I detected a gleam of excitement in my young friend's eyes. Now I summon a ride, she said. With a cold flush of dread, I understood what she was talking about. I realized why Lugaselwa had given her that coin, and part of me wished I'd thrown the gall a few more blocks. Oh no, I pleaded. You can't mean them. Not them. They're great, Meg insisted. No, they are not great. They're awful. Maybe don't tell them that, Meg said. Then she threw the coin into the street and yelled in Latin, Stop, O chariot of damnation!